This podcast is produced by the Center for Deployment Psychology at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. The views expressed are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Uniform Services University, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. In addition, references to any specific companies, products, processes, or services does not necessarily constitute or imply endorsement by the Uniform Services University, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Welcome to CDP's podcast, Practical for Your Practice. Where we give you actionable intel to support what you do. One colleague to another. Welcome back to Practical for Your Practice. I am Jenna Ermold, one of your hosts, joined by the fabulous co-host, Corinne Lefkowitz. Welcome again today, Corinne. Thank you very much. Glad to be here as always. It's always a pleasure co-hosting with you. And, Same. And I'm and I'm really glad you're here today because um, we have a fabulous guest and uh, I feel like kind of the outsider in today's discussion because I've never gotten to actually practice what we're going to talk about kind of more specifically. But before we get into the topic, I um, would like to say hello to our guest today, Dr. Paula Domenici, who is a longtime colleague and friend of mine, I think 17 years, Paula, which I can't even believe. I know, Paula. I know. I was thinking about that it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of nuts um and uh we are glad to finally convince her to join us today um paula would you just say a couple things about yourself and what you do at cdp Sure. Welcome, um, everybody. I'm so glad to be here with my colleagues. I started at the center, as Jenna was mentioning, um, about 17 years ago to this week, I think, um, and started as like a military behavioral health psychologist working at the National Naval Medical Center under the center, and then gradually um, took on the position of being one of the directors of various training courses and programs that we teach. Um, I help manage those programs. And then I also specialize in treating PTSD. So it's great. I get to teach uh, prolonged exposure therapy and assessment of PTSD. And then I have a small telehealth practice in the evenings where I get to practice some of the, the treatments. Fabulous. And that is exactly why we wanted to talk to you today, because you have this perfect kind of um, collection of experiences that uh, I think a lot of our clinicians will relate to. Um, one of the things that everybody is faced with in their clinical practice is really deciding what treatment options maybe fit best with a client who has PTSD. And I think on this podcast and, and in a lot of the discussions we have, we really talk most about those first line treatments like um, C cognitive processing therapy. Corinne is one of our CPT trainers and prolonged exposure therapy. Paula and I are both PE trainers. Um, but sometimes that's not the best fit or in a different approach uh, or, or even um, sometimes even a setting like primary care can drive what what makes most sense for that client. And so today we wanted to really talk about kind of that continuum and maybe um, more specifically patient-driven care in our sometimes messy practices that, that aren't sort of those easy to figure out um, sort of those more traditional frontline, first line manualized treatments. So Paula, one of the treatments that I know you have worked hard to learn and have used in your practice is written exposure therapy, um, which Corinne, I know you've also had experience with. So this is where I'm the person that's left out. I have not had experience with written exposure therapy, um, but we wanted to talk about you know, again, what that experience has been like for you, things you've done to brush up on that. So if you could maybe just talk to us first about like, why did you want to learn about written exposure therapy and what was that process like for you? Um, well, I had, I was lucky I was able to take the training by Dr. Brian Marks, who's one of the originators. He came to Walter Reed and um, I felt like it was really important to learn another evidence-based PTSD treatment that was kind of up and coming and I had heard had a lot of promise. And what was probably most appealing about it from what I'd heard is that it was, you know, brief and no homework, right? Um, and I thought it might be a nice addition to my toolbox because not everybody wants to do prolonged exposure therapy. As you know, Jenna and, and Corinne, um, I know you're really familiar with it. 
you know, it, it involves a lot of investment, a lot of out of session work. And just for some patients, it's going to be a turnoff or the fact that you're going to need to talk about your trauma narrative, you know, to your therapist aloud and go face um, trauma triggers in your real world, that it might not just not be sellable to a certain subset of PTSD clients when, in fact, we want to give them the best treatment options possible if they won't go for the gold standards, let's kind of look down to the next level and have it at the ready to, to provide to them. And so what I have found is that I'm really grateful that I have it as one other kind of tool, one other intervention to use with patients with PTSD. Um, and I can explain more like how I might use it, but particularly if they're not inclined to use an evidence-based therapy like prolonged exposure therapy, that I have something else that's not just um, stress management, nor just supportive counseling and has growing research to support it. Paula, I love that summary um, that you gave and, and kind of telling us the describing the distinction between something like CPT or PE, which are um, longer, uh, more intense treatments, you know, yeah. anywhere around 12 sessions or, or more mm -hmm. um, compared to something like what, which I'm so curious to hear if you had a similar reaction uh, to what I had in hearing about what for the first time um, written exposure therapy being a five session protocol generally being a uh, work that the patient is doing largely on their own kind of writing detail mm -hmm. about the trauma while you sort of sit quietly and watch and then give feedback to um, at a later date is so in my mind it's I was skeptical I'll be honest I'll just say it I was skeptical when I first heard about it that this could really work so easily and so quickly and I wonder if you had the same reaction that I did I did um, I definitely thought it seemed skeptical. Um, I thought it might work with, you know, someone with one-time trauma, what we call a simple trauma, not a chronic PTSD. It almost seemed magical, too good to be true. Although yes. when, I heard, when I heard Dr. Mark's talk, I mean, he had a lot of evidence to support it. And it is gra grounded in theory, you know, comparable to some of the theoretical underpinnings that we know for PE and CPT. So there was enough there to kind of spark my interest um, despite the skepticism, knowing that um, it may or may not work, but I didn't think it would do harm. And just um, feeling like the training I got was pretty compelling. Like, why not give it a shot in those cases where a patient could benefit and they're declining, again, something like PE or another um, even more evidence-based therapy? I'm so glad that you overcame your skepticism, Paula, because you frankly um, motivated me to look into it as well by by attending the training mm -hmm. and talking about written exposure therapy. You then made me to think, OK, well, maybe maybe this is worth thinking about because Paula's pretty logical and and um, pretty evidence driven. So maybe there's a good rationale here. And so, as you know, I attended the training as well, and I've been doing it a little bit in my own private practice. But I'm curious to hear from you what your experience has been? How has it actually played out in your practice? Um, so I'll be frank, because uh, in preparing for this uh, podcast, you know, I was reviewing in my head, how many patients have I done written exposure therapy with or a version of it? And um, I've done four where I pretty much followed the program, but then one of them I had to modify. And then two others, which interestingly have been with individuals with acute stress disorder, or an acute stress reaction where, um, and that's what I wanted to suggest, that it might be a good fit for patients kind of in that, that part of their um, trauma reactions where early on just writing about it, whether it's in session and or at home, again, I know writing at home is not part of the protocol, where it may, it may be very helpful to get them to start just getting it out. So I've only used it a handful of times, but I, with one of my cases, it went to a T perfectly. And it happened to be my first case. And maybe that's what encouraged me to keep going, even though I knew, oh my gosh, this probably won't happen again. <laughs> it was like the perfect storm of everything good happening. Um, literally just five sessions. He didn't want a longer evidence-based psychotherapy. So, you know, this was the great, a great fit for him. 
his uh, PCLs went down, his insomnia severity index scores went way down. I mean, he's down at zeros and fives on the all three inventories and the depression inventory. And quality of life, he was you know ready to go. He he was an EMT and didn't want to leave that job. And after doing the treatment, he was able to continue that that job which he loved. So that was incentivizing to use it that very first time, and it weren't went so well. Um, but again, I was skeptical that maybe it wouldn't work so well with a patient with more of a chronic PTSD or more traumas than he had. And um, I mean, I can tell you a couple other cases if you want where I've had to modify it or interesting things have come up. But just a reminder to the audience, when you use written exposure therapy, typically the protocol calls for five sessions um, once a week where patients write in session um, continuously for 30 minutes and on their own without you interjecting. And they can do it in your office or they could also be in another place in the clinic where it's quiet and they know the the amount of time they have to dedicate to literally just just writing about the traumatic event and you give them written you give them instructions that are highly scripted i mean literally you're reading the scripted instructions and then you give them a written form of the instructions so if they need to remind themselves what to do um, but you're not, again, interjecting, supporting, even if they're in your office, like I, I will be doing something else off to the side. But I lost my train of thought there for a second. So No, that was it. You actually read you read my mind because my next question was going to be, can you kind of give the thumbnail sketch, which was really helpful because I think a lot of our listeners might know not know a lot about what what that protocol looks like. So thank you for doing that. Um, and. I, I have two competing questions, but I'm going to save the one question um, and just kind of wanted to touch base with Corinne because I know she also has um, utilized the protocol. What has that experience been like for you, similar to how Paula just talked about it? Yeah, I've gotten to use it twice now in my private practice, and they've been two very different circumstances um, that I've done it with. But like Paula is suggesting, it was really driven by the patient's needs and preferences. And, and that's how we ended up at WET since I do primarily do CPT or PE with patients with PTSD. This was kind of a deviation for me. Um, the first case that I did it with was somebody who had a um, moderate traumatic brain injury that really prevented him from being able to engage in the very, very structured treatments like CPT or PE just because of his cognitive limitations. It was really tough for him to remember to do homework and to um, be tracking suds or be working on worksheets. It just was not going to be an option, a good option for him. So having written exposure therapy um, was a fantastic option. And that worked great for him because he just needed to attend for that 45 minutes that he was with me in session and not worry about homework. And he did really well and he had great outcomes um, in terms of his intrusive symptoms. They really declined. Like I said, it was wonderful to have that option for him since he couldn't make use of other options that I might um, gravitate to. And then the second client um, that I used it with was somebody who had more of the acute stress reaction. It had been just a couple of months, um, not quite three months yet, about a month and a half uh, since her traumatic experience. And she wanted to get back to work. She wanted to get back to being a parent. She had a lot of obligations and things um, that she wanted to attend to. And she felt really optimistic that with just a little direction, she could deal with her traumas. And she, I gave her all of the options, including PE and CPT. She chose written exposure therapy, and I think it was the perfect option for her. And after exactly five sessions, um, she was doing great. It's been two months since our last session, and she's maintaining her gains. So it's been really fantastic. So it sounds like for both of you, there were sometimes some patient characteristics that made you consider like Corinne, you know, your client with TBI and some of the limitations that drove that decision making. But for both of you, I was hearing my client really expressed a preference and I wanted to be able to meet them where they were. Um, Paula, did that, did what Corinne described resonate with you in terms of um, experiences? I know you gave us one experience, but you know, what about what you yes. said resonated with your experience? I'm thinking of another one of my clients that I used it with, and um, we would have preferred together to do prolonged exposure therapy because we we both kind of agreed after I educated her that it would likely 
uh, be, nor- be more durable. And like the outside homework sessions may create even that much better of an outcome for her, but she didn't have time. Literally, this was a woman in the National Guard. She was taking a master level course. She also ha- um, had entered a graduate program, had a new puppy, had a boyfriend. Her life, she was just able to acknowledge, I don't think I can achieve all the out of session homework and listening to the recordings. So um, in, in this point of time in her life, recognizing that maybe later on, she may be primed to do another more intense EVP. This was like where we could meet and where where she could make some gains. Um, and then maybe later on we would revisit using one of those other ones. And she did some really good work. Yeah, she um, her 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 levels went down. Her PCL scores went down. She felt more in control of her trauma. Um, et cetera. But I did feel like with her, it was the beginning of her work. We had to end up um, stopping our treatment because I left that practice, et cetera. But I left her kind of with the frame of mind that later on, if you get the chance to take another one of the EVPs that's longer term, this will have served you really well to kind of get you primed for it and ready to go. And in the meantime, you know, your, your PTSD symptoms have reduced some. But again, meeting her where she was at, knowing that the reality of her situation was not going to allow her to do prolonged exposure therapy or something more intensive. And so I wanted to, I couldn't force it on her. You know, I was trying really client centered and right. some good, a good chunk of work got done. But again, I think she could still at that point could have still benefited later with even more. I, I love that example. Um, one thing that I keep thinking about hearing both of you talk, both of you, knowing both of you are very skilled um, PE therapists and then, you know, Corinne CPT, that after doing that work for so long and having ways of engaging with clients when you see certain things come up and themes come up, questions you ask, you know, in the context of those treatments, I imagine that it is sometimes challenging when you're doing written exposure therapy to not drift back into sort of PE habits or CPT habits as a clinician. Um, and sort of how, how how was that for you to um, sort of set these new these new habits or did you catch yourself kind of drifting into a rationale or drifting into something that would be more standard in one of those sort of longer manualized treatments? Karen, do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, no pressure or anything. Um, Yeah, I really appreciate that question because for me, I feel like it is always really hard. I I feel very, um, I'm grateful to be knowledgeable about both PE and CBT and now a little bit about written exposure therapy. And, um, you know, you hear something, you're doing one approach, you, let's say you're doing PE, and you hear something that like would be really a great stuck point in CPT to work on. And it's really hard to shut your mouth and not go and pull out a worksheet or, or try to work on cognitive restructuring in a way that doesn't fit in. And it's, a, a, to me, that has also been the case with written exposure therapy that um, because it's a bit more of a passive approach, it's really tempting sometimes for me to grasp from my more active approaches of challenging or asking the person to um, explore more, et cetera. I will say with the structure of written exposure therapy, it's a little bit easier to maintain because you literally don't have the time um, to do some of that work and you have scripts written word for word in the manual about what you're supposed to read. So it is a little bit easier, but I'll say for myself, the temptation is often there. How about you, Paula? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, the hardest part is to not want to engage in some of that cognitive restructuring or helping to facilitate insight, but also just to remind the audience that after the patient writes for that 30 minutes, they give you their written narrative, but you're not reading it then. So you, uh, it's not like you have read or heard what their trauma is about. You ask them, ask them about the writing experience itself. Like, what was that like today? Was it hard? Um, And then later on between then and the next session, you're going to review their written account. But the only reason you're really doing it is to give them feedback if they're following instructions. 
So this has kind of been ingrained in you when you're reading the protocol and following it, right? Like it doesn't lend itself as Corinne is saying, because your next step is in, there's another script you're going to write after you collect it, after you ask just how is the writing experience for you. You're going to talk about if you hear anything, if you think of anything over the next few days, um, just allow yourself to kind of allow any feelings and reactions to surface. Just don't push anything away. Like there's a script about that, but there's not a lot of, process time, literally. Um, and so it kind of forces you to just keep moving along. Yeah. I did have one patient that I want to mention where he definitely needed more guidance than just doing the writing alone and then reflecting on his own and gaining insight. This is a case where I consulted with one of uh, my colleagues and I decided it was not enough for him that literally he needed more support in guiding him to, you know, gain insights and draw, you know, more helpful interpretations of what had happened. So for this case in particular, after having met um, for consultation, I actually had him write the trauma narrative at home. Then he came in and read it aloud. And then we processed it. So it really was a, a blend of prolonged exposure therapy and written exposure therapy. I had been tracking his PCLs and also the PHQ-9 and noticed that his suicidal ideation was going up during the regular wet work. Um, and therefore, that was an indication, you know, like kind of curious, why isn't this working? And I really feel like this was a patient that that needed more. And yet when I had suggested doing prolonged exposure therapy initially, um, he declined. And that's why we chose written exposure therapy. I think that's such an important point because I know we're we're gonna we're talking about um, you know, patient-driven care, but the provide, you know, we as providers still really need to be in charge of what's appropriate level of care and mm -hmm. you know, what's our patient presenting with and the the um analogy I used to always give, you know, when clients really needed that higher level, but wanted something different was like, I, I also in good, in con good conscience can't give you an aspirin when you need penicillin, you know, I need, mm -hmm. I yes. need to make sure my recommendations sort of fit what, what you're presenting with. Um, and so like, let's have a good conversation about the pros and cons of you, you know, making the choice to take, to go to the pharmacy to get the penicillin. Um, so That's you know, I really appreciate that point. I love that analogy. I often use something along lines of I can't I can't offer you physical therapy when I know you need surgery or when I think you need surgery mm -hmm. or um, I can't offer you just an antibiotic ointment when I think we really need to get in there and clean out the wound. So all of those analogies, I think, are often helpful um, to, to think about. Paula, you um, you kind of started me thinking about uh, times that you have to make modifications or mm -hmm. times yeah. when things don't go as planned, which is a natural segue to a topic that I think, you know, we've been chatting about on our podcast this season, which is what we're calling our EBP confessionals. And uh, we wanted you, we wanted to talk with you as we are with all of our guests this season about times when treatment, whether it be written exposure therapy or something else, didn't go as planned. You had a hiccup or you made a mistake or just things kind of fell apart and hopefully how you recovered uh, from that. So I don't know if you have in mind something that you can share with our listeners. What's coming to mind is actually with a written exposure therapy case. Um, it wasn't a huge faux pas or a blunder, you know, nothing catastrophic, but it threw me for a loop because this was a time when I was doing written exposure therapy via telehealth. And I think it, it was like the first time I was doing it through telehealth. And in hindsight, I should have thought through things a little bit more carefully when it came to how does the patient give you that written account that I've just been talking about. If you're in session, it's easy. They just give it to you, right? Um, and so when I'm talking to my patient about, you know, I'm going to want to collect the written account after each each time you do this, actually it was in the it was in the actual treatment session. So this wasn't in a pre-planning session. She did not want to send it to me via an email attachment, you know, which I thought, you know, I'd been doing some of that in other other treatments, like people had gotten kind of comfortable with using attachments, at least for measures. And so I, I kind of assumed that she would be okay with that. And I was caught off guard, like, in hindsight, I probably should have said, well, could we use share screen and I take a photo of it? Um, 
But what we decided she was most comfortable with, interestingly, was to mail it to me, to snail mail it to me to my home address. That's interesting. <laughs> wow. and, and that's not safe either. <laughs> and here I am giving her my home address. And I, I just, I was caught off guard. I couldn't think of another way. And she was pretty set on that and thought it was a good idea for her, her comfort level. Um, and so that's what we ended up going with. And I know I got one of them later, like I didn't get it before the next session, right? Because the, the mail was delayed or she put it in the mailbox later. So right. even, I never changed it throughout the, the five weeks, even though after time, I kind of was like, this is not the best idea. So uh, it just was a good learning experience where sometimes when I'm caught with questions, I think I, in that instance, I gravitated to going with what she wanted really quickly because I wanted to appease her. I was just so happy we'd come up with a way to brainstorm around that problem solve around it and I yeah in time I should have just been more thoughtful and you know using the share screen or some other way to do it would have been better I can just imagine how much pressure was on you at that moment like end of the session you have to either one of you have to get going you have to wrap up Mm -hmm. the session you haven't you realize you haven't talked about this in advance and the solution that you were prepared to offer that has worked for other people suddenly doesn't work and and you don't want to you want to come up with a solution and you don't want to make the patient feel bad about the solution that they proposed i can just imagine so many variables that make you want to that force you to answer yes yeah mm-hmm. yeah that that i can i can relate to that as well that sort of panicked feeling of like oh oh my gosh you know we've got to figure this out now and realistically i think that ha- that pops up for us clinically in so, like so many places that's a great concrete example of one doing telehealth but the solution really is just to pause right like we, yeah. you didn't actually had to figure it out in that moment you know boy i've not come up against this let me let me ponder it for a minute and i'm going to get back to you with a solution mm-hmm. that i think can work for both of us but we tend to sort of like panic and jump in there so i appreciate you sharing that cuz i'm sure a lot of our listeners can very much relate to um to doing that. So the, yeah. the last thing, Paula, and our and our, our time has flown because it's been such a fun conversation um, that we want to leave our listeners with is, do you have some suggestions, some, some things that our listeners could take forward from this podcast, you know, sort of relating back to the larger topic of patient-driven care, um, some recommendations you might give specifically with written exposure therapy um, or some actionable intel that they can kind of apply in their practice related to this topic? Um. I mean, I think I would encourage folks to to buy the written exposure therapy for PTSD manual. It's and we can put that in the chat or supply it shortly. It's a really easy to read guide. Um, and the authors basically kind of give the backdrop as to why they have developed this briefer treatment that has kind of growing and promising evidence that it works, that doesn't involve homework. Um I am reluctant to say that if you just read this alone, that you're ready to go. I think it should be paired up with the training. But the problem is, and Corinne, maybe you know better than me these days, it's hard to find um, a training in written exposure therapy. I think Pezzi has one. I don't know where um, Dr. Sloan and Marks, when they're offering it, like I don't know on the VA website where, again, where you can readily find a training in this. But I think obviously you would need to read the manual if you can get the actual training from experts um, and then consult with someone who's been using it. There are a couple of randomized control trial studies that have come out comparing CPT to WET. There's two of those. And in both of those, WET has been found to be non-inferior. And then most recently, one just came out comparing WET to PE. And again, wet was found to be non-inferior and fewer dropouts. So I'd be happy to share um, links to those articles. I think that those can be very informative to kind of understand um, the protocol and how they compare and contrast with the longer EBPs. We do offer a two-hour module on written exposure therapy as part of the STAR Behavioral Health Providers Program. It's called a sustainment workshop where again, um, people could begin to learn about written exposure therapy, but that's not the intensive full day training. 
Thank you for summarizing that for us, Paul. I think you've given us some really good um, ideas for any listeners who want to move forward with learning written exposure therapy and getting familiar with it. Let me kind of summarize a bit and then add in my own, if you don't mind, my, my own actionable intel, if you will. So it sounds like step one would be to get your hands on the manual that's put out by Drs. Marks and Sloan, um, the written exposure therapy manual. Um, and two, if possible, consider getting training in it and, and knowing that kind of the the amount of training that's being offered right now varies or will vary from time to time. But certainly the authors of the manual um, are are providing trainings from time to time. And we at CDP have a, a CDP presents webinar that we've recorded on WET that you can access and we'll put some links in uh, the show notes to help you with that. If at all possible, in addition to reading the manual yourself and getting the training, of course, on this podcast, we always recommend consultation. So that's no surprise to anybody who's listening here. And I would just add um, something important that I think we talked about on this episode is really being mindful of the patient who's sitting in front of you, what they need what their preferences are, not only in regards to their trauma and their symptoms and presentation, but also what resources they have in their daily environment to be able to attend to treatment, complete homework, time allowance, et cetera. And really thinking about patient-driven care um, if you're able to offer a variety of treatment options. Corinne, could I piggyback on one thing that I forgot, uh, one point I forgot to make, again, so the audience understands, that the um, the protocol does allow for a slight modification in the sense that if a patient, if you feel like a patient has not benefited over the course of the five sessions of writing, and you feel like you need a sixth or a seventh, that is doable as you're tracking their SUDS levels, they do a SUDS rating pre and post writing, and then you're collecting their like PCLs. Um, and also the manual goes so, so far to say another modification is that you could, a patient could do really great work on one trauma, five sessions, six sessions, and then you could actually move to a second trauma and use the exact same uh, protocol. And I have a patient where I did that, where um, our, the first trauma, we worked six t- six sessions on it, he he made some gains, but we felt like he would benefit by focusing on a totally different trauma trauma that had a different theme. And we did six sessions on that one. So he needed more than the average kind of um, standard treatment under wet. And that really worked well. So I just want to make sure, you know, audience members, folks know there are some some ways to enhance the existing kind of standard five session protocol as is appropriate for your patient's needs and as you track their progress. Thanks for making that additional point, Paula. Um, you know, you've, I think you've kind of undersold yourself by saying that you're just getting familiar with written exposure therapy because you are really knowledgeable and, um, you, you just have thought a lot about this approach. And we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and experience with us and with our listeners. Um, so helpful. Now, in past episodes, we've joked to listeners that maybe we'll hand out people's home addresses, um, our guests' home addresses, in order to get more <laughs> consultation. With you, it might not be a joke. Should we give out Should your they, home address at the end of this episode? They can send me oh, postcards oh. like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was really a pleasure to have you here, Paul. Jenna, did this inspire you at all? Did this get you interested in written exposure treatment? It did. It, it, I'm super interested in it. And and uh, I just currently don't have that private practice the way you all do. But um, perhaps one of these days I will get myself sorted and I would be very interested in uh, in giving it a try for sure. Well, we'd love to welcome you into the club when that day comes. Um, but until then, thank you once again, Paula, for being our guest today. Thanks to our listeners. This was a great discussion. Jenna, thanks for being a fabulous co-host as always. Happy thanks. to be here. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. See you next time. Thanks for listening to Practical for Your Practice. Please feel free to subscribe, like, and share. Until next time.